Uh, okay, uh, I'm afraid we'd love to take questions. Sadly, there's, uh, we don't have the time, so if you're around in the break, we'll, uh, we'll get to that. Thank you. Um, so our next session, if you were one of the uh, elderly gentlemen like me who remembered Vincent Ka Victor Kayam, you probably remember Reader's Digest from a few years back. Uh, very different now, um, a, a modern brand, and part of a stable of modern brands that are doing really interesting things in digital and elsewhere. And to talk to us uh, about that, please welcome the Chief Digital Officer of Trusted Media Brands in the USA, uh, Vince Errico. Vince, who I hope is here. Yes, he is. <laughs> Vince, hi. Stage is yours. Thank you. Hello, uh, I'm Vince Errico. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I had the great good fortune of uh, living in London very early on in my career, so it's always a pleasure to uh, come back and kind of see, see what's going on and, and uh, the changes here. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, digital media uh, strategies for special interest brands. You can see on the slide uh, we have about a dozen brands. Reader's Digest is perhaps uh, the best well-known. Um, and uh, this is a bit of a case study. So uh, I have sort of six main uh, points I'll make. Some of it will apply more generally to most of you, but uh, depending on your market and your brands and your titles, your audiences, uh, obviously there'll be uh, some, some differences. So to understand the case study, I think it helps to have a little bit of context. So uh, we're a US-based company uh, founded in 1922. Uh, the company changed names two years ago, so often I get the question, who is Trusted Media Brands? Uh, we were known as Reader's Digest Association, so, um, and that's how many people still refer to us today, in spite of the fact that Reader's Digest is not, no longer our, uh, our largest brand. Um, Several publishing companies were then uh, joined together. Uh, one of our challenges, in fact, was to, uh, one of the speakers earlier today talked about uh, innovation and efficiency. Uh, the company had never taken advantage of pulling some of the efficiencies together across these different titles that had been brought together. We have a book division. We have 12 different titles. The four largest are Taste of Home, Reader's Digest, Family Handyman, and Birds and Blooms. We're in over 50 countries. In the US, we are uh, a top 50 com score property in terms of uh, monthly uniques, which is over 50 million. We have over 40 million uh, monthly print readership. And uh, Canada is another one of our very large markets where uh, Reader's Digest and Selection, which is the French version of Reader's Digest, is the number one read magazine in Canada. Uh, and our Selection uh, website uh, reaches 15 to 20 percent of all French Canadian speakers. So we uh, virtually dominate the, uh, that market. So one of the first things uh, that I did was to look at was we were trying to, be, I've been at the company about two years now, we were trying to have a digital business without actually having a digital product. So the websites were a relatively flat affair. So one of the first things I did was to just undertake uh, 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 looking at uh, and defining what each of our brands needed to be in the digital media environment. So looking at competitors and near competitors. So when I first arrived and I asked for a competitive study, uh, I was shown a lot of data, but it was all, uh, everyone was look, only looking at uh, our print competitors, but in the digital environment, rather than looking at the broader competitive set uh, that uh, we were competing with uh, in the digital environment looking at competitive areas of, uh, uh, of advantage and differentiation. And differentiation, I think, is a key point here. I'll talk about it again. Um, looking at revenue sources, uh, how do we then use the various uh, digital properties that we have to continue to drive magazine subscriptions, to continue to drive book sales, uh, advertising revenue, as well as looking at other 
uh, streams of revenue. So uh, we recently launched an online learning platform that uh, is doing quite well among certain of our titles. Uh, and then looking at the audience, uh, the characteristics of the digital, the online audience uh, versus the print audience and understanding how to cater to their needs, uh, how to segment them so that you can start offering unique things. Because if you think about the digital environment, it's very possible to get very niche very quickly. And finding that in our universe, in our audience, and catering to that, um, uh, and uh, really just uh, looking at that sweet spot, and that's really uh, then where we said, okay, this is where we will place, this is where we will try to find the sweet spot, this is where we will place each of our titles. Um, this is just a very standard uh, perceptual map uh, to say, okay, once you pull all this data together, where are your competitors, or what's everybody doing, depending on which brand attributes are important to you, uh, and then uh, figuring out where your brand fits within that environment. Uh, upper right is the standard placement, so that's where I've put, uh, <laughs> that's where I put it in this slide. Um, and then the gratuitous word cloud, because we're talking about digital. But the word clouds can sometimes help when you're looking at research to understand which brand attributes or which brand values are very uh, important to, to uh, different brands. So the second uh, point I want to make is just really understanding, deeply understanding the medium and adding more people on the team who do understand. Um, and this has many legs, uh, like an octopus. But understanding the strengths and weaknesses of the various media that are, just, uh, that are now available on digital. So it's not just... Uh, the written word, but it's video, it's audio, it's infographics, it's interactive widgets, quizzes, and so on. Um, and people expect to find that these days. So uh, really, in defining your brand, understanding which of these different types of media are appealing to your audience or which segments of your audience, and what is your entrance using those different media going to be uh, in your digital presence. And of course, then uh, understanding the ROI of each of those, because they are, they are all very different. Um, it's not easy to make that uh, transition. You heard about uh, transformation from one of the panels earlier today. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, and I will also just say that the, the digital ecosystem is inherently more complex than print. So when you think about the metaphor of squeezing a balloon and it sort of pops out on another end, um, in digital, I think of it as popping out several different places. So uh, there are, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But one of the ways that that manifests itself is really with who you, who you bring on your team. So in the digital world, you have uh, people who are better at what I would call multitasking. You often have editors who are very good at, at data analysis. So they're taking in the information about what's performing online uh, and able to tra translate that into other editorial ideas or uh, fast follow-on uh, content. Um, or they may be very process-oriented editors who are then very, very good at figuring out what's the original inspiration for uh, an editorial piece, translating that into social media and newsletters and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and understanding how to make the most of, let's say, a content management system that might be quite complex with all the different kind of tagging that you might need to do for meta information, for search, et cetera, et cetera. So that idea of people who, who have multiple skills, they may have one primary function, but multiple skills, is absolutely key. And it's true with ad sales people. So they're going to drive better deals, uh, uh, higher margin deals, if they understand some of the how the underlying technology works. Um, 
And uh, you know, if you have uh, designers who also understand user experience or also know how to code and can hand off a finished piece of code, uh, so, so much the better. It's going to drive, you, uh, drive your digital business much further, much faster. Um, so in bringing on these new team members, one of the goals is what I call leapfrogging ahead. Uh, so if you have lots and lots of time, you certainly can take the people that you have and train them to do uh, these other tasks or to look at these other things, and certain people on the team are going to have these aptitudes uh, regardless. But you don't, but often what happens, even in that process, is you go from sort of a horse-drawn carriage to the horseless carriage. When, if you bring on the right people, you can leapfrog that stage and go straight to this lovely high-speed automobile. Um, there's no need to have to translate, and in fact, it's, a, it's, a, it's um, a, a trap to try to translate everything you're doing in the offline world into the online world. And you see this across every discipline. So in, for example, our consumer marketing area, offline we may use uh, regression analysis for our marketing models. Um, online, we, we, we've sort of leapfrogged ahead and we start to use machine learning because when you take millions of pieces of data instead of one or two or a handful of salient data, you start to have much more complex models and you don't actually have to just go through the step of the similar kinds of straightforward regression analysis when you can actually end up at a better place more quickly. Um, and uh, this is another sub-point which is uh, if you're a special interest brand like one of ours, you are very likely to have much, much more exposure on other platforms or other sites than on your own site. So this actually um, is, a, is a different way of then thinking about how you're representing your brand on those sites. And, um, how you use that environment on those other sites to draw people into your brand or to understand your brand because they're likely to be new audiences as well. Um, and it's really what I call a shift in industry thinking. So I do say I'm in the publishing business, but I really think of it as an audience aggregation business. So we're looking for people who are interested in our topics and may have an affinity to want for one of our titles. And then we're engaging them wherever they are with our content and then turning that, find, finding ways of monetizing that group of people. So the third thing I want to uh, talk about is just really understanding the costs and the revenues of your traffic driving efforts. So I, I, you have, so if you're like us, you have videos, you have articles, you have slideshows, listicles, audio, infographics, user-generated content, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I break it down into five main uh, sources of driving traffic. Uh, there's most of them you're familiar with, search, uh, newsletter, social, uh, our partners, and then, of course, if you do any uh, paid traffic generation. Um, and the way that I think about it is assigning sort of a, a channel manager for each of these channels who really is looking at the overall P&L for each channel and partnering with various people across the company to make the most of that particular channel. Um, and generally speaking, uh, search is going to be your highest margin channel uh, for a variety of reasons, which uh, I, don't, I won't have enough time to go into, but, it, it, but if you think about it this way, then you're, start to, you're managing actually a portfolio. So it's almost like, and I'm, uh, my background is financial services, so I'll make another financial services reference, but this is very much managing a portfolio of search driving, search tra uh, sorry, traffic driving efforts. Um, the fourth thing I'll talk about is disinter disintermediation in the industry. So, uh, again, financial services background, this is, there are a lot of similarities, I think, with what is happening with ad technology to what was happening in financial services in the 90s. So, looking at, so, uh, I use this example as don't, don't go NASCAR. So, uh, the, uh, for smaller brands, oftentimes one of the 
what I would call knee-jerk reactions to driving revenue is to put more ads on the site. Uh, and if you have a chief revenue officer or a publisher, that will often be their first instinct to say, oh, just put another ad spot, put another ad spot. But you end up with this, where you can barely even see the number of the car driving. NASCAR, for those of you who don't know, is uh, racing cars in the US, a very uh, popular uh, particular kind of racing car, uh, not Formula One. Um, so resist the urge to just continue to add more spots on your website. That rarely is going to yield a higher revenue or higher margins. Um, so when you're looking at your ad technology vendors, I think it's very important to also really understand when they say, oh, it's just another little piece of JavaScript to add to the page, what that really means. So looking at alternative methods of managing uh, tags, uh, looking at header bidding solutions, um, and understanding and monitoring what that bit of JavaScript is actually doing to your page, because it may be slowing down load time, it may be you didn't write that JavaScript yourself, so it may be interfering with other code you have on the page, and uh, uh, which has happened to us, and it's, it's, a, it's a tricky thing to diagnose. Um, Having fewer uh, well-managed partner definitely drives faster page load times and more revenue. And again, uh, as with the traffic driving sources, I really think about this as having a manager for each of those vendor partnerships. M most managers can handle many, many, many partnerships. It's not a one-to-one -one relationship. Uh, but having that P&L for that vendor, having someone be able to call them up every day and say, when we tested this, I was getting really high CPMs, and now that we've rolled out, we're getting low CPMs, what's going on? And diagnosing either technology problems or uh, any, any other problem that, that that vendor might be able to help with. And really what we're looking to do is drive to this overall yield management uh, and, uh, and or margins. Uh, for, uh, so what are all the revenue driving sources, whether it's advertising, whether it's subscriptions, books, whatever else you're selling, how do you uh, uh, do your overall yield management? And that really comes down to understanding everything that's happening on the page at any given time and making the right trade-off. Uh, fifth is developing very clear plans and communicate, communicate, communicate. You really can't communicate enough. Uh, you'll always have more projects than resource. So that very beginning uh, slides that I talked about of sort of understanding where you are, that really sets the tone of what kinds of projects and what you're going to prioritize. Uh, and then being able to staff and resource against that. Uh, determining your priorities based on goals and what those dependencies are. So sometimes there's something you have to do before something else, uh, and it's important to make sure you don't, uh, you don't skip some of those things or you can't get to the something else. Uh, aligning resources and having parallel tracks where it's possible. Uh, identifying resources and skills gaps very, very early on telling everyone who needs to know, telling them again. When they act surprised, you patiently tell them again. Uh, and then measure and report how things are doing. Uh, because, um, what I, because when I think of print publishing, it's very much a narrative-driven business, partly because some data just doesn't exist. But digital or multimedia uh, business is much more data-driven. So it's very important to understand and measure get the right measurements, share that information uh, broadly across the company. Uh, so don't pretend there won't be cultural changes or that they don't exist. There absolutely uh, will be. Uh, even small process changes are cultural. So I think it was the CEO of Dennis who had that lovely cartoon of who wants change, but then who wants to change and who wants to lead change. Like even small process shifts uh, is, can be a, a type of cultural change that can lead to all kinds of upheaval. So get ahead of that curve. Now it's going to happen. Start to get the right resources in place to support those changes. Um, and then uh, don't be surprised if 
uh, you get to a completely different place or new businesses to add on to your business. So you heard about uh, sort of uh, continuity programs, boxes being sent, uh, selling cars. It's like once you start gathering all this, you start to see that there are actually other opportunities. And I think it's also important then to balance that with something that um, uh, Condé Nast uh, said earlier today, which is uh, you don't want too many revenue streams either. So uh, place your bets and, uh, and move forward. And gratuitous word cloud, thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Vince. We might have time for uh, one question, if it's, uh, again, a relatively quick one. So do raise your hand uh, if you have a question following that uh, uh, panel. And a quick one from me. You yes. mentioned that uh, the importance of finding the right people, you know, people that can make that leap to, beyond the horse discarriage. How difficult a process has that been? And were you looking for people that had media exposure already? Or did you need to go outside of media to find people that could think in that innovative way? Yeah, so um, it was very difficult to, uh, uh, to find new talent and to bring them in, particularly because uh, we, our brands were, not partic were known for being innovative in digital or technology. Um, and we did go out of the media uh, field to try and find people uh, to bring them on board. And also just to, sometimes it helps to have a different industry perspective and bringing that perspective a way of solving problems to, the, to, to our company. Makes absolute sense. So if we don't have any more questions, I'll ask you please to, um, in fact, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave that one there, sir, sorry. Uh, you could presumably speak to Vince just afterwards. I'm sure yeah, you'll take a question. I'll be thank you. Can I ask you please to thank Vince very much? Thank you. Uh, okay, if you're uh, main stage, uh, strategies for taking web native brands global, you're here. Uh, we have a very short uh, swap over break. And if you want strategic roadmap, that's around the corner. There is no third track for this next session. So just take a moment to reorient yourselves and we'll restart here in just a couple of minutes. Thank you. <laughs>